Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Baby Penguin and welcome back to Beyond Kerbal. This episode we are continuing our exploration of Reaper's Moons. Today, starting with Arados, the changed face of Lathe after 4 billion years. And as you can see there, uh, expertly demonstrated by Katrina Kerman, the atmosphere on Arados is actually breathable, only temporarily though. So although we can take our helmet off and the surface temperature is now actually high enough that uh, we're not going to freeze to death because I, I think to remember Lathe actually has uh, sub-zero surface temperatures. It just has extremely high saline content uh, in the oceans which you keep them from freezing. Obviously since uh, Kerbal has expanded uh, the surface has got a lot hotter and most of the atmosphere has since boiled away but we still have a few large lakes that we can explore. So, as you can see here, stored inside the cargo bay of our Mustang Cargo SSTO, we have this, the PAX Surface Exploration Vehicle, which, you might have noticed, has got a uh, rather large engine strapped onto the back of it. Well, that's because this is not only a long-range rover, it is also doubling as a submarine. That's right, we're going to go exploring the oceans of Arados. And you'll notice here the uh, the surface is really rather barren. Uh, I can't really come up with a scientific explanation for that. It's actually because the textures were broken. I didn't realize this until I sent uh, Games Links a few screenshots like, oh, look at this, look how cool it is. I'm exploring the oceans of Arados. And he's like, oh god, your textures are all screwed. Uh, so they do get fixed a little bit later on in the episode. But as you can see here, we get a lot of science from this mission. It's actually the first time we get to use a liquid chromatograph spectrometer which allows us to analyze the constituents of Arados's oceans which gives us a ridiculous amount of science points. See how Kerbal's there. Maybe, maybe going around with uh, without helmets on on a strange alien world isn't the brightest idea uh, but as far as we can tell Arados is completely sterile. Uh, so we don't think we really need to worry about it too much. But that's what this expedition is all about. Just checking to see if we can find any signs of life on this barren little moon. So we just activate our water compressors and start descending below the waves. Now it took a little while uh, to actually balance out all of our ballast here so that we can actually get control over this submarine. But uh, once we manage to sort of equalize the storage of uh, our compressed water using the uh, maritime pack that is all the various different parts from that we manage to start exploring underneath the waves and we get some really rather beautiful shots there of us exploring the oceans unfortunately there doesn't really seem to be much down here i really do think that uh, the ksb devs should add a bunch of water exploration a lot of underwater features you know add in boats add in submarines all the various different things because, you know, that's that's a big aspect of planetary exploration. So many of the bodies, in uh, even in the stock Kerbal system, have got oceans of some kind. I think it's a bit of a missed opportunity that they haven't actually included them. But perhaps we can hope for that in KSP2. Provided we actually finish this series before <laughs> the next game comes out. Uh, which is certainly not a given. You see here, I decided to uh, just have a little explore. See if we could find any signs of life anything lurking in the deep but uh, unfortunately not there's nothing on this planet the oceans and the surface are all completely sterile a little disappointing but uh, a secondary sort of objective of this entire mission is actually to just search these various different moons see if we can find any signs of life and if we do find any we need to try and take some samples back with us so that we can also evacuate them to our new star because they are going to be suffering the same fate uh, as we would eventually fate uh, if we didn't evacuate all of our citizens to another star system. So, you know, we want to try and rescue as many life forms as we can. But uh, no, Arados is completely sterile. But there is, in fact, another candidate uh, in the Reaper system because Valiant, the new name for Val, that is, it had a subsurface ocean four billion years ago. But as Kerbal has expanded and the whole system is heated up, that subsurface um, ocean has actually been revealed as the ice has melted and Val has now actually developed a thin atmosphere. So we're actually going to be putting the PAX exploration rover back into our Mustang SSTO and sending it back up into orbit because we want to use this a second time uh, over on Valiant which is the outermost moon of the Reaper system now. You see here we're just heading on back to the SSTO and ending our first little expedition. But we've only actually explored one biome, although we have obviously explored the ocean, got all the 
clients from being splashed down and then we've explored this surface biome but there are a number of different biomes all across Arados so I decided actually you know what let's try and get a little bit more science I mean this expedition is already proving to be extremely <laughs> lucrative when it comes to world first contracts and science reports um, but we might as well see if we can get a little bit more out of it so we're going to head for the hills and see if we can hit one of the higher biomes I didn't end up driving all the way up to the top of the, uh, the peaks biome. I got as far as this second biome. And I thought, you know what, that's it. I'm going to call it a day because it took about half an hour to get up here. I was listening to uh, a couple of podcasts and I'm you know, working my way through my Spotify Discover Weekly playlist. Um, but I thought, no, you know what, that's, that's enough of that. I'm four times speed, took about half an hour. We found another biome and uh, I think that's enough. But we're going to plant ourselves another flag here just to stake our claim, even though these flags are certainly not going to last the, st <laughs> the test of time. And uh, yeah, there seems to have been uh, an intervening dust storm which actually covered the surface. It's definitely not because that was the moment at which I realised that yeah, the planetary, uh, well I say moon surface uh, textures were all completely broken. Because Games Links uh, it turns out compiled the install incorrectly. Uh, it turns out that was the case for a bunch of moons, so thank god we found it now. Uh, <laughs> so the surface is now looking considerably more detailed. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's uh, it's all fixed now. So we're just going to get Katrina out, get her back into the SSTO, and then what we're going to do is load the packs back up inside, because we uh, don't want to be heading up, up to orbit without it. We made sure that the Mustang has got way more than enough Delta V to actually carry this thing back up, because I believe this rover weighs about 50. 15 tons. I did actually make a mistake here uh, and I forgot to completely unload all of the compressed water that we used for ballast uh, <laughs> to actually sink below the waves. Uh, so I think the rover currently weighs about 25 tons which is you know 10 tons over the maximum load of this uh, <laughs> of this spacecraft. It does take quite a bit of finagling to get it back up into the cargo bay but uh, once we close the cargo bay we managed to sort of force it up against the docking port and we transfer our crew members back into the main cockpit. So now we've explored all the biomes, it's time to head back up. And it does take me, uh, I think, about 10 minutes of flying before I realise that the aircraft is way too heavy. I would have noticed a lot earlier, but Arados has got, I believe, about 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 Gs of uh, surface gravity. So, um, no, it must be, yeah, either 0 0.6 or 0 0.7, because uh, it is lower than Solitude. On Solitude, this would not have been able to take off, uh, especially with the Sabre engines we're using, uh, suffering quite a lot, actually, at low speeds and low altitudes. Um, so it does take quite some time for A, for me to then dump the, uh, <laughs> all that leftover compressed water, and B, for us to actually get to a high enough altitude that we can break through the sound barrier and start heading up into orbit. But we do get some really rather beautiful views, the vistas of Arados. Newly changed after, as I said, that uh, that recent dust storm coating the uh, the pale surface in a thin layer of brown dirt. All very, very dusty and desolate. Hopefully uh, Valiant will be a little bit less depressing because if you remember that Lave used to be almost completely covered by oceans and I believe the surface map actually matches the original um, the original uh, surface of lathe. So those mountains that you see are the actual original islands that you could land on back on the original lathe. I said original far, far too many times <laughs> in the past 30 seconds. Uh, that's what happens when you start running out of uh, things to say in your commentary. But you see here, this is after I realized that uh, we were carrying a bunch of compressed water. So we dumped it overboard and we're now accelerating through the sound barrier and getting ourselves up and into orbit with our three crew members, Katrina, Tibbin, and Obzi. Katrina and Obzi are actually uh, the two crew members that we sent down to the surface of the Wasteland back on our first mission there on the uh, Phoenix mission. So we sent them down to the surface of Arados because they have by far the most experience with landing on different bodies. They even had to bail out of that spacecraft on launch because it ran out of fuel before it hit orbit. So uh, yeah, we know that they're up to the task of flying an SSTO. See there, we did have to open the cargo bay temporarily just so we could uh, get an atmospheric reading because we did get one, get one on the descent, um, but we need to get a second one on ascent so that we can have an extra copy for our various different science labs. Not that it you know really matters which Kerbals we're actually sending down to the surfaces anymore. I was going to try and spread the experience around, but uh, just by heading to the Reaper system, all of our Kerbals are now level 5, um, which is crazy because some of our scientists were only level 2 and just by travelling to this system and getting into orbit around Arados, 
all of them have leveled up to level 5, uh, which I guess says a lot about just how difficult it is to actually get Kerbals all the way out here, um, because, yeah, there's <laughs> apparently enough experience for them all to suddenly be masters of their craft, which, again, you know, highlights just how important this mission is. We might already have all the technology we need to build an interstellar capable spacecraft, uh, but as I said, as well as us having still a bunch of time left before Endurance even tells us if there are any habitable planets around Valentine, uh, we also need to be leveling up all of our crew and still unlock a number of other technologies that will make our life a hell of a lot easier when we do eventually get out there. So that's the crucial importance of both this mission and our Constellation mission around the wasteland, which will actually be heading home soon. Uh, I've made sure I've got a timer on the transfer windows back to Solitude, and it looks like this mission and that mission will both be heading home uh, pretty soon, I think just in a couple of hundred days or so. So uh, then, once they're back, of course, the travel time is significantly longer for Morningstar to get all the way back to Solitude. Uh, so it should be about three years of in-game time before they're all home. Then we just have to wait another three years or so for Endurance to arrive at uh, Valentine, and then, yeah, we can get heading off. I'm not going to sort of waste any more time in this uh, system. We've landed on everybody now. Well, we will have landed on everybody uh, <laughs> in the Kerbal system by the time these missions are complete, so uh, I don't think we're going to waste any more time. We'll finish these two massive great big missions, and then we'll get ourselves heading on to another star system, which is really rather exciting. I did see um, some very, very good name suggestions in the comments of the previous video, especially some good naming themes as well. So uh, some of you might get lucky and have certain things named after your suggestions. I did like uh, the sort of the cut of your jib. Uh, and so, yeah, we've got some, uh, we've got quite a few different things to choose from, I feel, uh, when it comes to naming that mission. But we might not just send one mission. I I'm undecided whether to send a fleet of spacecraft or to send just one colossal spacecraft with enough necessary um, modules to land on a planet and then produce all the next spacecraft we're going to need because we're going to need to get somewhere get to this habitable planet get into orbit and then essentially repurpose the interstellar spacecraft as like an orbital construction dock send all of our modules down to the surface build a self-sufficient colony which can then begin expanding itself then unfreeze all of our colonists send them all down get them all settled and then i feel that we could then you know start refueling the main spacecraft uh, shipping up supplies to it and then we could use that spacecraft again to continue exploring and colonizing the rest of the star system. I think it would be really awesome if we could do it all just with one giant spacecraft. Um, yeah, because just considering the travel times are ridiculous <laughs> and the amount of effort it takes to build one of those uh, interstellar spacecraft is going to be pretty immense. So, uh, yeah, maybe we'll just, you know, we'll have the rest of the series just follow one set of Kerbonauts. I think that could be quite interesting. Have 50 sort of frozen colonists and then just have a main crew. Of, uh, of our experienced Kerbals. I think that could be really quite interesting. But anyway, as you see there, we have redocked the Mustang SSTO back to the Morningstar mothership. And now it's time to start heading to one of the next moons. So the next moon out is actually Valm, which is the new name for Pol. That is Valm with an M. Some people misheard me in the last episode, thought I was saying Val. Now Val has been renamed Valiant, uh, but all the different moons have sort of moved around uh, in the intervening four billion years, as well as Bop smashing into Tylo and creating Tilos. But Valm is actually the only moon that remains relatively unchanged apart from the name of course you know the debris from the bop and tylo collision has scarred its surface and the intervening few years have uh, changed its shape slightly but it used to just be a pretty boring little dusty ball in space and that's pretty much what it still is and its sphere of influence is absolutely tiny it's absolutely winky compared to all the various other moons it's now the only small moon actually in the system since bop has as i said smashed into tylo but although it's rather small and insignificant it's actually crucially important to this mission as a refueling post all the other moons in this system have way too high gravity for us to really efficiently use them as some kind of refueling ground, a staging post, whereas Valm has got really, really low gravity and it's covered in very, very useful ore. So, you see that lander right at the front of Morningstar? That is our Severo lander and it has a number of mining drills on it and it's pretty much entirely covered by ore tanks. It has one small fuel tank which has all the Delta V it needs and then the rest of it is just covered in holding tanks for ore. So we're going to be sending that down to the surface to mine ore. It's going to come up to the mothership where it will be refined into liquid fuel and oxidizer and we're going to completely refuel all of our spacecraft ready to then continue out to Tilos 
and then Valiant, and then head all the way back home. We probably could have done this all in one go, but I thought it would be kind of interesting to, uh, to you know, have a have a pit stop at Valm. And, uh, and yeah, I think it certainly turned out interesting. Instead of just, you know, just landing on yet another planet and then, well, another moon, and then just buggering off to the next one. No, let's actually, let's actually stop for a while and use it as a staging post. Certainly meant that this mission could be a lot smaller uh, and a bit simpler and reduce the lag a fair bit. But you can see there we get a rather beautiful shot of us coasting in amongst the moons. It really is so beautiful just travelling between the moons of a gas giant and all the delicate orbital mechanics and watching them all orbit round. It uh, really is something special. And perhaps, you know, we'll find a habitable moon around another gas giant in the Valentine system. There's nothing saying that the habitable planet we're going to find is going to actually be a planet. Uh, it might be a better candidate to actually go to one of the moons. But you see here, we're having to start burning before we hit the sphere of influence because we have such a high relative velocity uh, to the moon. And also, its sphere of influence is so tiny. Uh, but we managed to break uh, just enough that we can actually do a orbital insertion within the sphere of influence of Vam. Um, you see there, it's absolutely titchy. And there we go. We slow down enough, we head into the sphere of influence, and we start getting ourselves all of our different science reports. Now, this takes a little while, because uh, once again, we have to get four lots of science reports, one for each of our three science labs, and then one to store and take home. Although we've actually filled one of the science labs completely with data at this point, uh, so we're just trying to fill the other two, and once we fill the other two, we'll stop taking duplicate reports, um, because there's really no need. There's, they're not going to get through all of that data by the time we get home. I'm thinking for the return journey, um, we'll freeze all the non-essential personnel, but then we'll keep uh, a number of the scientists awake for most of the return journey just keep them researching uh, all of that data all the way home and generating as much science as they can because I believe now they're all level 5 and most of the science labs are pretty much full of data uh, they're producing something like 25 science per day which of course changes depending on where you are but uh, but yeah it's, <laughs> it is a lot of science I'm not sure how we would have done this series if we didn't use science labs I think some people actually play career mode without using them uh, but especially with the difficulty settings we're on, we never would have got through the interstellar tech tree if we were just recovering science reports that way. I think 90% of our science has come from orbital research, which, to be fair, makes sense. But anyway, we've got ourselves into a relatively circular orbit of Valm now, just circularizing the orbit so that we can make an orbital survey and then actually see the resource distributions across the surface. And then, in the next episode, we will be descending to the surface using our Severo lander and taking its bounty for our own and refueling all of the various different parts of this mission. As I said, we probably could have done it all in one go if I was a little bit more sensible with our <laughs> insertion burns, use more gravity assists, but honestly, I couldn't be bothered. It wasn't that much effort to put a mining spacecraft on here, and as I said, I think it makes the mission a little bit more interesting. So we're just going to transfer the crew across. We're going to send some different Kerbals down to Valm this time, a scientist and an engineer, although, well, I guess Tibbins our only engineer on this mission, so Tibbins going down again. <laughs> but we are using a different scientist, at least. Peter Kerman, one of our original four our badass scientist will be heading down in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I've been the Beardy Penguin, and I will see you all next time.